Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about the theory behind object-oriented programming or OOP. Specifically, we're going to be going into detail into classes, attributes, and methods. So to recap the last lecture, we showed you guys what OOP looks like in action. We saw you what it looks like in a real program. You guys saw how objects have attributes and how these attributes can be changed and how they're unique to a certain instance of an object. They're not shared between all objects. They are all unique to each instance of the class. We also saw how classes have functions and how these functions can be used by the instances of the classes, which is what we call objects. We didn't go too much into the theory of it. The main purpose of that was to show you guys how the, the OOP looks like in a real program and just to not intimidate you with too much theory before you guys saw code. We wanted you guys to see the code, see that it isn't that complicated before we got into the nitty gritty details and the theory behind OOP. So as mentioned before, this lecture will focus a lot more on the theory behind OOP and what all the individual parts that make up object-oriented programming are versus a lot of code. In fact, this lecture will not have any live coding and it will be a lot of theory explanation to give you the context needed to understand what OOP is, why it is, why it's important, and how it's used. We're going to give you a little bit of background on OOP. We're going to talk about all the individual parts that a class contains. We're going to be talking about what an object really is, as well as what the class attributes and class functions slash methods are. These are pretty much the main parts of OOP, and it's what we'll be discussing in this lecture. The theory, of course. Um, last lecture went in depth into what it looks like when it's in action. This lecture is going to be talking about just the theory and the background of it so you guys have the context needed to really code effectively using OOP. So to provide a little bit of background for OOP, OOP is just a programming paradigm. A paradigm is just a way of solving problems, like a way of thinking about things. So OOP is a programming paradigm that focuses on data instead of the logic. It, it, it focuses the design on objects and then on functions and logic. So it tries to make everything an object or a class or categorize data into the type of data it has to see how it can effectively you know, solve a problem versus focusing on the functions and logic and then using the data. It'll be a lot easier to understand once you're doing some programming, once you have a little bit more experience with OOP, but that's basically the main gist of it. OOP allows for extremely modular code, and it's very easily to work in a team setting using OOP. OOP allows you to split up the code very easily and to work um, in a team setting easily. The code can be split up across multiple team members, and they can work independently on a single class or multiple class, and then combine all their work together very easily. Now the main difference between OOP and the other kinds of programming paradigms is that in OOP we're focusing on data first and then on everything else. We're focusing on getting categories, we're focusing on getting classes and just defining data in a useful way for computation. So first we have to talk about what is a class. So in OOP a class is a template for creating objects. A class contains attributes, it contains methods and it contains a constructor. So the attributes are kind of just the the parts that a class has that contain the data. The constructor is what is used to create the class, to create an instance of a class, and the methods are just, you know, the functions that a class implements. And a class it, it's just a blueprint. It's pretty much just a blueprint for creating an object. It's a set of instructions that the computer has to follow to create an object. That's pretty much the main, you know, description of a class in OOP. It's just a template for creating objects. So an object in OOP is just an instance of a class. So if a class is a blueprint, then the object would be the thing you make with that blueprint. An object is going to have all the attributes that are defined in the class, and it's going to have access to all the functions and methods that the class has implemented. And again, the object is made using the constructor that is present in a class. 
an attribute is a property of that class. So it's just a variable. It can be of any data type and it's present in all instances of that class. So for example, a car object may have a speed attribute or a weight attribute. It could also have a color attribute, a model, a make attribute. It's just data. An, an attribute is just data that a class has that kind of is like a description. It's, it's like the properties of that um of that class. And all of the instances, all of the objects made from that class have their unique set of attributes. Now, the, li the, the types of attributes that they have are shared between classes, but the individual values that these attributes have are unique to each um, object, to each instance of the class. A class method is just a method that's coded within the body of a class. So all instances um, of a class have access to the class methods and then the class methods are just regular functions. So they can take in parameters or they could not take in parameters if they don't want to. They can interact with the class attributes. They can also return values or not return anything if they like. They are just regular functions except they are present in the body of the class and only the objects of the class have access to the function itself. So we talked a lot about a class and what an object is and all the parts of a class, but we haven't really talked about how we make it. We said that a class is a blueprint and that we use a constructor, but we haven't really gone into detail. So the way an object is created is through the use of a constructor. So a constructor, it takes the blueprint and it actually generates the object. And the constructor is, it's just a function and all it does is it creates the new instance of that class. So we have, a, if we have a car class, then the car, you know, constructor would use the car class as a guide to create an instance of a car. Now the constructor is defined within the class by the programmer and the constructor may be passed some values for the attributes or not, but the attributes within the class must be set to some value. They can be set to an original value or they may be set by the constructor asking for the values, but they have to be set to some value. So the constructor is what constructs the instances of the class or the objects. So now we talked about all these parts in an abstract way. We talked all about OOP in a very abstract way. We didn't really go into too much detail. So now we have to understand how all this comes together in Python. So the next few slides will focus on just that. How does all this stuff, all these concepts, how are they appear in Python? How are they present in Python? How do they, how are they coded up in Python? So first up, we have to talk about Python and OOP and why, you know, OOP is important in Python. So Python heavily uses OOP for most of this code. Pretty much everything in Python is an object. Everything you see is an object. Whenever you see a string, that's an object. A list, that's an object. A dictionary, that's an object. Almost everything in Python is an object. It's one of the languages that uses OOP the most in its um, development and as part of its just general use. It's extremely versatile when it comes to OOP and it allows for very you know, scalable and modular OOP code. If you want to do some really advanced OOP programs, Python is a really good language to use for it because it lends itself nicely to advanced OOP you know, practices very well. So before we start talking about all of the individual parts of OOP in Python, I wanted to stop for a second and show you what a class looks like in Python. I want you guys to see that a, a class is, looks, is very simple. It's not too complicated. I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed, but I want, I'm, we're going to go through every single part of this um, class and describe it in detail in the next few slides. But I wanted you guys to see that an, a regular class in Python is not that complicated. It's not that many lines of code and it contains stuff that you guys have pretty much done already. For example, up here, this is how you declare the class. You use the class keyword and then the name of the class you want. You put your class attributes here. It's pretty much just making variables and assigning them some initial values. You guys have already done that. And then everything else is just functions and you guys have already done functions. It is very straightforward once you practice a little bit and there's nothing to be scared of as we go through it and we explain it. It's just another tool in your t in your programming toolbox and it's a very powerful tool
Now it, it's a bit confusing and it, this video might require more than one rewatch to completely understand but that's why we give you guys the other video first. That's why we give you guys a practical hands-on look first and then the theory. That way now it should start making a lot more sense. We recommend that you watch this video as many times as needed and then refer back to the previous video where we actually do a bunch of code and example. This will help it click a lot better. So to define a class in Python, it's actually very simple. You have to type the class keyword, follow it by the desired class name, and then a colon. After that, all of the code that goes into the class is referred to as the class body. The class body is indented, you know, as we usually do when we have colon. Everything that belongs to what the colon, you know, is used for is indented. Now on the bottom of the screen, you can see an example of how you define a class with all of the different parts of the class below that we'll get into as we keep adding to this class. Now. If we go back to the previous slide, the class definition is just this single line. Everything else are is, is different parts of the class, but the class definition is just up here. Class, the class, the name you want for the class, colon, and then everything else is indented. So to add attributes to a class, all you have to do is just declare an initialized variable somewhere in the class body. Any variables that are declared within the class body will be considered an attribute. They must be given some initial value in order to function properly. So the attributes value will most likely be overwritten when the object is created, so a dummy initial value may be used. You don't have to figure out what initial value, you know, you should use if you are going to immediately overwrite it when you when you make an instance of the class. You can't just use a 0 or a 1 or a true or a false or a null or just something temporary because you'll most likely be overwriting the value of these attributes when you call the constructor to create an instance of the class. So after the class has been defined and you have a couple of attributes then the constructor may be written. So the constructor for a class in Python is called the init function and that's init with two underscores before and after the init. The underscores are vital. So the init function must contain the self keyword in its parameter list and the constructor may be given additional parameters if the programmer wishes to but it is not necessary. The parameters that you give the constructor however must be values for your parameters. This is the only thing that makes sense. If you're given something the constructor should be things that decide that, that affect the parameters. Now the init function should ideally contain the least amount of code possible. This is because the init function is what runs every time you attempt to create an instance of the class. So you don't want to have a lot of code or some code that has large memory requirements or space requirements within your constructor if it's not needed. So once the init function finishes, then an instance of the class is returned to whoever called the constructor. So the parameters that should be provided to the constructor are the desired values of the class's attributes. Traditionally, the name of the attributes and the parameters are, are identical for the constructor. The way you differentiate between them is to use self to specify which value refers to, wit, to, the, to the attribute. So whenever you use self, you are telling the interpreter that you are referring to the class's you know, variable. In this case, the num the self dot number one is referring to the number one attribute, and not the number one parameter. And then the equals number one, that one is going to be referring to the parameter number one, and not the attributes number one. So what's happening here is that we're grabbing um, the number one parameter and putting its value into the number one attribute in the constructor that's present to the right. That's how you make a constructor. If you want more um, parameters, you can add them. Or if you want less, you can remove no number one. But you must always have at least self in the constructor's parameter list, and it must be the it must always be the first parameter in the parameter list. So to create a class method or function, it's actually very simple. It's 
literally the exact same way you would create a function or a method except it's placed within the class body. Now one small caveat if you want the function to interact in any way with the attributes of the object you must include self as the first parameter in the parameter list. This tells it that you know it's going to refer to the object itself and it allows it access to the attributes. Just like we had it for the constructor, we have it for the functions. This is only this only has to be used if the function uses the attributes for the for the um for the object. If the class does not make use of the attributes at all, maybe it just prints out a message that has nothing to do with the attributes, then theoretically the self could be omitted, but I would recommend that the self is always there just to be safe. Now on top of the self parameter you can include additional parameters or you can have just the self as its only parameter. Once you call these functions you only have to provide it with the parameters besides self. Self does not have to be provided, it's provided by the interpreter itself. It's kinda like the object itself is providing its own self parameter. Now within the class functions you can update parameters, you could get input, print messages, do calculations, have if statements loops, um, pretty much do anything you want just like you could in a regular function. Now for classes it's usually useful to have class functions that interact with attributes that make decisions based on what the attributes are, have functions that update the attributes based on certain you know criteria. For example, you could have a car class that has a bunch of different functions that interact with the attributes. Maybe you have a speed attribute that you change by using the change speed function or maybe the accelerate function. Maybe you have a check and check um fuel level function that checks the fuel level attribute and depending on its level it either turns on or turns off the low level indicate the low fuel level indicator on the dashboard. So the class functions are very useful, but they're pretty much stuff you've already seen. They're just regular functions. The only small caveat is that you're always going to have at least one parameter being self if you interact with the attributes at all. And this self parameter, you don't give it anything when you call these functions because the object itself gives it the self parameter for you. So to create an object from a class, all you have to do is you just have to call the class name as if it was a function and the parameters you give it are the parameter list besides the self parameter. Again, remember the self parameter, that, that's, that, that's taken care of for us by the interpreter. You only give the parameters for all other parameters. So if we didn't have any other parameters, we wouldn't give it anything. If we had more, we would give it you know those but we don't give it the self parameter the interpreter does that for us so in the bottom left of the screen you can see how we're making a my cool class instance and putting it into the my cool instance variable we're giving it a 3 as its parameter the my cool class and that 3 is going to be assigned to the number one parameter and then when the constructor runs as we mentioned before the number one parameter is going to be assigned to the number one attribute now whenever you're talking about an attribute in a class, remember you have to use the self dot attribute name, you know, format in order to refer to it properly. And all functions that refer to any attribute must include self in its parameter list because to re to refer to the attributes you must do self dot and then the attribute name. So once the uh, the class function so to speak finishes executing, once that my cool, cool class 3 function finishes executing then the uh, class will return an instance of the my cool class class and save it in the my cool instance variable at which point my cool instance again contains an object of the my cool class which is going to have its number one attribute set to three and then the my cool instance can use all of the class functions that we have already written for this um, class so now we have to talk about how an object uses its class methods. And it's actually very simple. The way it does it is by following the by following the following format. You just do object name dot then the class function, you know, that you want to use, 
along with the parameters. Now object name refers to the variable that actually contains the object. That's the general format you're going to use. Now in the following slide here we can see an example of me using the class methods using the, the class we've been creating throughout this video. Now all you do you just type the the name of the the object we have which is called my cool instance dot and then the name of the function you want to use along with the parameter list if there's any so first I print the value so we can see that the um, the value of number one is actually three the output you can see it on the left side of the screen afterwards I update the value of number one with a five by calling the cool class function function and then I call the print value function again so we can see that the value was updated. I also call another function called scream that all it does is prints out scream to the to the console. Now theoretically the scream function could be written without the self in the parameter list since that function is not making use of the attributes in any way but again it's sometimes safer to include it just in case. Now as you can see you don't include anything for the parameter self. The self parameter is taken care of by the object itself. You don't have to worry about it. You only include parameters after the self parameter. So the print value and the screen f um, function don't have any parameters besides the self. So when we call these functions we don't give the parameter list anything. However the cool class function has self and new number one. So we don't give it anything for self but we do give it a single parameter to take care of that new number one. If you have two or three parameters then we would include in them the same order they appear omitting the self parameter. But this is simply how you would use a class method once you have instantiated an instance of that class. So this brings us to the end of our theoretical OOP lecture. It, the, throughout this video we showed that OOP is an extremely useful paradigm and we showed how Python and OOP really go well together and how important they are to each other. So now at this point you pretty much understand all the basic parts of OOP with the exception of inheritance and polymorphism. These will be covered in the next lecture. And again this lecture's main goal was to really go into the theory behind OOP. That's why there, was, there weren't really any live coding segments. It was all just pre-written um, code segments. If you want to see some OOP live coding I would highly suggest you watch the previous um, lecture video which goes really in depth into a OOP code and how you write it. This lecture was just meant to provide as much context and theory as possible so you guys understand OOP at a much deeper and fundamental level.